Hello friends, uh, my name is Dr. Amit Ranjan and I teach literature at Regional Institute of Education, Bhubaneswar. So today we'll be discussing this um, classic short story called The Last Leaf by O. Henry. O. Henry is one of the most important writers of um, fiction in literary history and The Last Leaf is one of the most important stories um, as well. So let us have a look. The story is about two young girls, Sue and John C., um, who struggle to make a life out of um, art. So the story starts with Sue and John C., two young artists, shared a small flat. The flat was on the third story of an old house. Now, the opening lines of a short story are very important because a short story, like the name suggests, is short. It's not long like a novel. So novel gets a lot of time to um, set its setting, describe its characters, make its character rounded, and so on and so forth. But the short story does not have that much scope. So it has to get right away into business. And so the opening lines are always very important. Here, once again, let's see the opening lines. Sue and John C., two young artists, shared a small flat. So we're given a lot of information that there are these two young girls who share a small flat. The flat was on the third story of an old house. Also that it's an old house that they have to live on the upper floors. So this is about locating characters in a short story in terms of finding their social location, the economic location. And so this is about the struggle of young artists um, so, of course, we know there are many successful artists who make a lot of money, who are very successful, who's painting um, self for lakhs, millions of dollars. But there are lots and lots of artists uh, who struggle their way through in their youth, also in their old age, as, as we'll um, um, see over here. So, what i like to bring your attention to is that this is not a fairy tale with a beginning like once upon a time, there was a king, and so on and so forth. This story is very grounded um, in its location, in who these artists are, where they live, what their circumstances are. And so it's densely packed right at the beginning. You get a lot of insight into who these girls are and where the story is likely to go. The premise. So what is a premise? A premise is a statement on which an argument would be based. Um, so you make a statement and then you argue towards it. So in this case, the plot is the argument. So John C. is very ill uh, and been lying in bed for some time with uh, pneumonia. So for a young girl like her, it should not be a big problem to recover, but she's just not recovering. There's something that is bothering her in her mind and the doctor who's visiting them cannot quite figure it out. And so uh, I quote from the story. The doctor said, John C., it seems, has made up her mind that she is not going to get well. If she does not want to live, medicines will not help her. So this is a strange pronouncement that the doctor makes that a young girl um, does not want to get well and she could um, die of pneumonia. because. Um, and again, see the brevity of words where he says if she does not want to live. So it's almost that he's pronouncing her demise, her death sentence, um, which is very interesting. So as we'll see in the next slide, this is a psychosomatic problem. So what is psychosomatic? Psycho, as you would guess, well, is from the word psychological, um, pertaining to our mind. Somatic is pertaining to our body. So when our body starts getting affected by our mind, that is when we call it a psychosomatic problem. So in this case, as the doctor is saying, John C. does not want to get well. So even though she is young, she may not get well. And you would understand that this happens to a lot of people and you would see your friends also around you that they become melancholy or depressive um, because they cannot resolve certain matters in their mind. They cannot reach out to um, friends or family and it starts affecting them and they get unwell. So this is very pertinent uh, in terms of young people. And so this is a heavy word, but 
um, it's it's good to add it to your vocabulary as well. Um, so this is a psychosomatic problem. <coughs> so some fun um, things, since we have talked about somatic relating to body, um, there's another term called sociosomatic snobbery. So this was used in the um, 19th century for elite rich ladies um, who would faint on hearing bad news. So if you said, oh, someone fell from the horse, and even though the lady would not know the man, um, she would be very distressed and would faint. So this was a part of their training. So how do we explain it as sociosomatic snobbery? Somatic, as you know, is related to body. Socio is related to society. So when your body starts reacting to the society, so you are trained in a certain way in the society to behave. We all are. And snobbery is when you look down upon uh, other people, or feel that other people are inferior. So the rich people of England in 19th century, um, the rich ladies were trained in such a way that they had to be very delicate, very fragile, um, very pretty, um, have a certain figure, and so on and um, um, so forth. So as you would understand that uh, how we behave is a reflection of how we are trained in the society how we live in the society, what manners are trained to us, which um, are uh, training from our families, from schools, friends, all that matters. Um, and so you have understood this term, but you would understand that how we behave is um, related to our, our social training, the way, the context we live in, and not essentially as who we are. And so women need not be delicate, beautiful, fragile, fainting, they can be merry calm. Um, um, and so here the title says, but that's a stereotype. A stereotype when you, is when you have certain assumptions about what roles are. For example, that uh, again, girls should play with kitchen sets and guys should play with guns. And this is also a cause of a lot of problems in the society, as you would see that the society is fighting for gender equality. And so, uh, you need not be a fainting queen. You can be Mary Com, a boxer. You could be an auto driver, like there are in Chennai many auto drivers who are women. You could be Kalpana Chavla, who's, um, uh, who, uh, who was an uh, uh, astronaut. And so you see, all these are traditionally male roles, auto driver, astronaut, boxer. When you say these words, immediately you think of a man, but all these three were women. And so, what I want to... Um, impress upon you is that gender roles are defined by the society and we should constantly learn how to question it. There's a very interesting story, Toys by Roland Barthes, which you should read. It's a short story, again, or an essay rather, where he says that the toys that children play with in their childhood um, form a very lasting impression in how they formed as adults. And so, boys are given cars and guns, that's what they like when they grow up. Girls are given kitchen sets, that's what. And so, these roles that you have to perform in society are, are defined through this construction. It's manufactured, it's not naturally there as is assumed. Great, so let us get back to the story after the psychosomatic snobbery, sorry, psychosomatic condition and sociosomatic snobbery and about gender roles. So, the hallmark of a traditional short story, the new short story, the modern short story is different. Um, now there are different kinds of short stories that are written, but we are talking about end of 19th century, early 20th century. And so these short stories had a beginning, middle and an end, like an essay as well. So there would be a proposition, like I said, a premise, it would build up and there would be an end tying it. And so we see in this story that John C. is really sick, and that is the beginning. Her friend and she, um, she and Sue struggle through it, and then there is an end. We'll come to the end in just a little while. So as the plot thickens, there is no redemption. Sue tries very hard. She talks about clothes, fashion, painting. She whistles um, to John C. She does all the exciting things and all the exciting talk, but nothing would cheer up um, John C. And then John C. whispers um, something, and it's a countdown. 
the countdown begins. So I quote from the um, story, 12, after some time she whispered, 11, then 10, then 9, 8, 7, 6, whispered John C. They're falling faster now. Three days ago there were almost a hundred leaves. Now there are only five left. It is autumn, said Sue, and the leaves will fall. And so, the plot of this novel is this, that John C. lying in bed, suffering from minor pneumonia, has been seeing a tree outside her window and it's fall season, it's autumn season, so leaves, the trees shed leaves. So obviously the leaves are shedding, falling, but John C. somehow in her mind thinks that her life is related to the falling of leaves. So this um, is not mentioned in the PowerPoint over here, but if you would like to know the term, this is called pathetic fallacy. So pathetic fallacy is a condition when um, the condition outside in nature starts reflecting in our life or so we think and so John C as part of a pathetic fallacy started thinking that um, that her life is dependent on the life of these leaves on this tree which was shedding leaves and so she has been counting and that is why she has not been getting better and so what the doctor said that she does not want to get well is quite correct because she is counting the countdown of leaves and waiting for the last leaf and she thinks that she will die the day the last leaf will fall. So John C. says, when the last leaf falls, I will die, said John C. with a finality. And so this is the exact psychosomatic behavior that um, I was mentioning. That... She has completely internalized in her mind. This has got no logic to it, but she's internalized it. And this is the way our bodies can eff get affected by our mind, because our minds are so powerful. The plot thickens. So on a lower floor, there's an old painter, Berman. Um, he was a 60-year-old painter. His lifelong dream was to paint a master's masterpiece, but that had remained a dream. So once again, you see how the story is reinforcing the condition of artists. There are these two young artists who are struggling, living in a small house. But there's also a much older artist also struggling um, and living in poverty. So not all artists are successful. So example, we hear a lot of um, success stories in Bollywood, for example, of Shah Rukh Khan, uh, who made it from the middle class um, in Delhi. Uh, he was not any star's son. But for one um, successful Shah Rukh Khan, there may be many failed artists uh, like these. So this is uh, also a story of all these untold uh, stories of characters who struggle through their life with a lot of talent and are not able to make it. Um, so Ber Berman has been planting uh, has been planning to paint a masterpiece all his life and that has not happened. So this is where the plot thickens and anticipation enters the plot that can Berman, through some trick, save John C's life. And so this is what we are expecting. This is not really out of the expectation of the story. So we are now anticipating that Berman will probably paint a leaf even if the last leaf falls. And that is how maybe John C. will get better. And this is exactly what um, happens, as we'll see. So the story says, there was only one leaf on the creeper. It was raining heavily and an icy cold wind was blowing. Again, notice the craft of the writer. How brief, how precise and packed with information he makes his um, sentences to be. There was only one leaf on the creeper. It was raining heavily icy cold wind was blowing. So if 300 leaves have fallen or 100 leaves have fallen as John C. claims in the last few days, why wouldn't this leaf fall, especially when there's a storm or a wind? And so that, you see, this is heading towards a climax where we are, we become one with the character of Sue and uh, we start getting concerned about John C., whether she will survive this or not survive this. And then, um, um, John C. sleeps and the next morning when she wakes up she looks out the window and the last leaf survives there is a last leaf 
and so um, uh, she is very um, encouraged that uh, that destiny wants her to live till now she was thinking that her countdown had begun and she would die with the end of the last leaf but with the last leaf surviving she has hope that the last leaf has been made to survive for her to survive like it's a sign and as we um, anticipated expected it's burman who painted the leaf the actual leaf fell and that is how she survives so this is called a twist in the tale though this is not the real twist in the tale because we were in a way expecting uh, because burman's character is given that he wants to paint a masterpiece and so also approaches him and tells about the matter um, and he gets at work so we are kind of anticipating that this could happen but the classic short story has a twist in the tale which is also a pun on the tale so a pun is a word which has a double meaning so it is t a l e and t a i l so the original sense is from tail like a twisted tail of a dog um and then it is used in this sense that tail is a story and there would be a twist in it and that's the classic short story the uh, best writers of the world in late 19th century early 20th century used uh, the idea of the twist in the tail and then the real twist in the tail comes when we get to know that mr burman the senior artist also contracted pneumonia um and the doctor comes and tells sue that um, uh, john c will live but mr burman may not uh, pull through because he's 60 years old and very sick so sue tells john c mr burman died of pneumonia this morning he was ill only for two days his clothes and shoes were wet and he was shivering he had been out that stormy night so that stormy night when john c was waiting for the last leaf to fall mr burman went out painted a leaf stuck it to her window um and that became the last leaf and it was so perfectly painted the entire context so it's not just a leaf that he painted he painted the entire window which looks like the creeper the leaf and the window and so the this new leaf despite the wind was not fluttering which johnson did not notice so he was all um um he was out all night painting this and fixing this to her window so that john c survives so it's a big sacrifice that mr burman makes a senior artist making way for a junior artist um and despite the fact that john c only has a superstition um or a whim as she is going to die with the falling leaf but to save her he makes this supreme sacrifice with his grand masterpiece which nobody can tell whether it's real or whether it's a piece of art so it's a beautiful twist in the tale and a beautiful ending most of o henry's um, um stories are like that um other stories with a twist in the tale there are many other stories but i'll give you um, a few examples and um, you should read them i bet you would like the bet by anton chekhov for example um it is about a conflict between capital punishment and um, freedom and money so there's a bet between two people a rich banker and a young man um where the rich banker thinks that the young man would cannot waste his um, life staying in a prison for um 20 years and they lay a wager that if the young man lives inside a room um without any human contact whatsoever with uh, with the world for 20 years um he would um get a lot of money i don't exactly remember how much and then the young man spends spends the time in his 20s and 30s reading books goes through several mood swings so it's a beautiful story the the way the plot builds up in terms of his loneliness and very pertinent right now since we are all um, have seen this lockdown and minimal contact with the human world but at the end of it the banker gets anxious his business has not been doing well that when this man comes out he's still in his 40s has a life to live and um, will get a lot of money and the banker will become bankrupt so the banker goes to kill him 
I would not tell you the rest of the story. You should read it yourself. I would not kill the suspense and the twist in the tale um, in that. Then there's the beggar by Anton Chekhov also, which is also in your um, um, course in the same book moment, which we'll be um, um, doing uh, in one of the next videos in which a man wants to reform a beggar and brings him home, gives him work, but uh, the beggar is too useless, does not work, but gradually improves. And then they meet several years later when he's decently employed, is earning a decent salary. But the reasons that beggar tells how he got reformed are again shocking. That's also a twist in the tale. It was not because the man was reforming him. This is also a story you must watch out for. Another one is called The Diamond Necklace by Guy de Maupassant. Um, here, the uh, young husband and wife, the wife borrows the necklace from a neighbor um, for a ballroom party, a costly diamond necklace, loses it, but they're too self-respecting the couple to announce it. Um, and they, uh, they buy a diamond necklace for her neighbor. Um, and they toil years and years to pay off the loan. And then there's a twist in the tale again in the story. So you must read this also. So the short story, um, the classic short story then hinges on these kind of twists in the tale and which is what makes them remarkable, which is what makes them um, uh, very noteworthy. And um, uh, they, they tell about the fragility of the human condition and also the magnanimity of, uh, of human condition at, at times. Um, these endings are shocking, and um, so these uh, short stories are very interesting. Okay, so now <clears throat> to the themes. So what are the themes in this short story? One is, what is real wealth? All the three artists that we have seen are um, poor, not well to do. Uh, we do not know poor exactly, but Burman's definitely seems to be uh, poor because uh, he gets wet and he's found in his wet clothes and his wet shoes. Um, so, what is real wealth? Is real wealth in earning money or is real wealth in service, helping fellow beings, um, in art, in doing what satisfies you? Is Burman the richest man? because he may not have earned a lot of money, but the kind of position that he earns in history through his sacrifice and through his art. We can clearly see that he's a brilliant artist, that he makes this leaf which John C. cannot detect, or nobody can detect that it's a fake, uh, false leaf. But he's not compensated with, with wealth ever in his life. And so his earning is art, and this is what we need to think about, we need to respect um, artists of all sorts, poets, painters, writers, um, and, and various other kinds of um, artists. So there is a need to respect art and artists. And this story um, um, tells us that uh, in very vivid manner. Another theme here is art versus living beings. I'm talk saying living beings, not human beings, because here we are talking of a living leaf, which is, um, which is dead. Uh, on which is contingent the life of this girl called um, John C. So, uh, art is able to save her life. And this is, has been a constant question with a lot of writers pondering over this question between what is art, what is life. So art, in a way, captures life. Art is a reflection of life. As we are told, literature is a reflection of life and so on and so forth. And similarly, photograph captures, photographs, video capture the moment. So they are archives of life, they are the preserver of life, and also the perseverer of life. In, in the sense, perseverance means to stick it out despite odds, to, um, to be firm despite all that is hostile against you in the world. So art makes you persevere. An artistic mind is able to struggle and also our mind has a lot of artistic, not just capabilities, but understanding. And it would be a very dry world in which there is no poetry or music or photography or uh, dances or various cultural things. So this story calls to light um, the plight of artists and the importance of art. 
So there's a very interesting poem by John Keats called Ode on a Grecian Urn, where um, he talks about an urn, a pot, a Grecian urn, on which are painted various um, uh, human activities. And this is an old urn that, that has been unraveled. Um, and so uh, he, this is from a time when there was no photography. There was some, um, uh, this is pre-painting time as well, the urn that he's talking about and how human beings always want to record their lives and leave it for posterity, leave it for future generations. So that's also an important theme. Another thing is, is the dilemma for doctors. Is half-truth good sometimes? The doctor tells Sue that John C. may not live. Um, one does not know if John C. hears her or not. We know that the doctor takes Sue aside. But... Still, it raises the question that uh, given the psychosomatic condition that we've been talking about, that is our mind affecting our um, body, is it sometimes good not to tell the blunt truth to people if they can be healed? Um, that is also a question we should think about. So there are psychological and psychosomatic issues. And uh, in a world with increasing stress, um, there are lots of issues of anxiety and depression amongst youngsters and these must be addressed and youngsters should reach out to their friends, to the elders if they're feeling anxious or depressed. It's very understandable um, given the stress in our society um, these days. Other themes, the value of empathy and sacrifice, the supreme sacrifice that um, uh, Mr. Burham makes, Berman makes and his empathy that he has empathy for a young girl, for a fellow artist. He sees his younger self in her, and that is why he does what he does. And at the same time, his confidence in his art, that his art can save uh, a life. And uh, the last theme that I am thinking of is the last hope. So the last leaf is the last hope. That human beings are tenacious, um, we have a general will to live, and if there is one little thing to live for, uh, one little thing to struggle for, we do that. Um, which is how John C. recovers, through the last leaf. And, and so it's very important to hold on to um, hope um, in life. Great. Um, so <clears throat> this would have piqued your interest in the writer himself. Um, o. Henry is his pseudonym. So pseudo means false, nim means name. So pseudonym is a false name. Various writers write under pseudonyms. O. Henry is one of them. He used various pseudonyms, but O. Henry is the one that um, stuck. Uh, his real name is William Sidney Porter. He lived between 1862 to 1910, which is why I've been saying late 19th, early 20th um, century. He lived mostly in Texas, which is in south of USA. Um, some interesting trivia about his life and related to this story. As a young man of 20, he had persistent um, cough. And the girl uh, he loved, Ethel Estes, had pneumonia. Uh, and so his parents would not agree to the marriage. And so they eloped and married. And so maybe the last leaf is um, influenced by his um, own memories of his wife's pneumonia as well as his um, persistent cough. Um, and so Porter was very talented. He was a witty person, a storyteller, a musician. Um, but that was not vocation. So art was still not um, lucrative enough to make a career out of. So he became draftsman, drafting uh, maps um, and stuff. Um, with a company in Texas, then he became a banker, became an editor in a magazine and so on and so forth. So he changed several jobs um, throughout his life to make a living and gradually also became a, a story. Uh, he was a storyteller as he observed different kinds of people on different kinds of jobs in society. He became a good uh, storyteller gradually. And uh, one of the things is he gathered his ideas in hotel lobbies. So he would hang around in hotels and in lobbies and observe uh, people, how they behave, how they talk. And um, of course, that's the hallmark of a writer. And if you intend to become a writer, uh, observation is the key that you look at daily life, daily conversations. And the interesting probably lies in the uninteresting, in the mundane. If you focus, you'll find many interesting stories 
around you. So continuing with Porter's um, life, interestingly, he was jailed for embezzlement as a banker. So his life looks very um, colorful and up and down and, and rough as you can see. Um, so first he got a bail and then again as, as the uh, case proceeded, he was found guilty and jailed for five years. So in the jail, he was a pharmacist. So he also had learned pharmacy um, <clears throat> sometime, one doesn't know when. And so one of uh, his uh, biographers and critics says that there was a man called Orrin Henry who was a prison guard. And it's probably in his memory that uh, he um, developed this pseudonym um, O. Henry. However, O. Henry or William Porter himself uh, in an interview says that he was just looking through a newspaper discussing with a friend what his pseudonym should be. And they picked up Henry and the friend said, OK, what about the first name? And he said, let it just be a letter. And the easiest letter is O, a zero. Um, and later he expanded it to when people asked him to Olivier Henry, French for Oliver. So these are very different kinds of background stories to um, the pseudonym O. Henry. And also credited um, to O. Henry is the term Banana Republic, which you sometimes read in newspapers, sometimes hear on um, television. Uh, so Banana Republic is a place which is considered politically unstable, like it was mostly used for Latin American countries, also now for African countries which are largely based on agricultural economy, do not have like uh, more modern systems in place like developed countries have. And uh, so generally Banana Republic is used for a place which is, um, which is politically in, uh, unstable and in chaos. And this is used in a short story collection uh, called Cabbages and um, Kings. And um, so I could end here with this image, which you should think about. Um, the last leaf that till there is hope, one should not give up. Thank you very much.